What is up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of HRTL Big with Swirl. This week's guest is Daddy Spencer. I'm sure you've seen him on TikTok. He's the dopest man I've ever met. My- oh, wait. He is the dopest trans man I've ever met in my life. He is 61 years old, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, we, I think he's the I think he's the oldest trans guy or trans person I've had on this podcast, I think. But he's up there. And he shared his knowledge, his wisdom with us. Um, and I respect the hell out of the guy. He's got quite the following on TikTok. Um, he educates uh, younger trans people on what it's like to be an older trans guy because there's not a lot of older trans men representation out there. I just absolutely love what he's doing on TikTok and I love the conversations that we had. He was very easy to talk to. Um, I learned a lot. He shared his wisdom with me and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Throughout the entire episode, my sign behind me shut off and went back on a bunch of times. So I'm sorry if the lighting in this episode sucks ass. Okay, I apologize. Um. But that's it. I hope you enjoy this episode. Go buy a sticker. Maybe. I would appreciate it. <laughs> and go subscribe to my Patreon! <sighs> Please? I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm sweating my ass off. I love you all so much, and I'll see you next week. Okay, bye! Right, Spencer, I'm going to start by asking you where you're from. Uh, so I am, fr- well, I live currently uh, a little bit north of Seattle, um, but originally I'm from Sweden, um, but I've lived in the States most of my life. Wow. Okay. I didn't know you were, you were from Sweden. That's really cool. Yeah. We moved here when I was two. So, okay. um, nice. yeah. That's dope. But all of my family, other than my parents, now just my mom, uh, are still here in the st- are still in Sweden. Everybody else is there. So. Oh wow, that, that's very cool. Yeah. I didn't know that about you. Uh, and yeah. where did you say you were living now? Just north of Seattle. North of Seattle. North of Seattle. How does that treat you as a trans person? Um. So I've been. I've lived here most of my life. When we moved to the states, we lived here and then when i was 10 we moved to minnesota and i left minnesota as soon as humanly possible uh after graduating high school and came back to seattle and i've been here ever since so one of the things that i've always really appreciated about western washington in general is how queer friendly it is and always has been um Mm -hmm. and so it made it easy to participate in community and to find other folks, which, you know, isn't always true, especially when you're in more rural places or sometimes just being in the middle of the country, even if you're in a bigger city. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm glad to hear that it's been queer friendly for you. And you said you've lived there most of your life, right? You went to you yeah. Minnesota for a little bit. All right, that's cool. Uh, another question for you. How long have you been on hormones? Since 1995, so 29 years. Holy shit, that's awesome. I I absolutely love to hear that, man. Wait, how old are you? I'm 61. 61. You know, we don't, I feel like the trans youth, I guess, doesn't really see a lot of older trans people. So... I just hearing you've been on testosterone for over 20 years, it like shouldn't blow my mind, but it kind of does. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. You know, and it's funny because like, I know so many other guys that are my age or even older um, who have been on T as long or longer than I have. Um, And so it's always funny to me when I hear younger people saying, well, we didn't even know we got to live that long or we had no idea, but I, I think one of the problems 
that I see about particularly transmasculine representation is the media doesn't even talk to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very true. You know, it's this weird kind of, I, I think of it as misogyny, right? So they perceive us as being forever female and therefore our voices are not as interesting mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but i yep. but the other piece of it is that they exotify and eroticize trans women and they don't do that with us yeah no very true and the way they like come after the femininity of trans women also misogynistic but like in a different way and it's i always have this conversation of like whether or not i would want it like because you know how trans women are in the spotlight when it comes to like trans representation in the media and stuff like they get looked at first especially by the other side a lot and i always have the conversation of like would i even want it that like the roles reverse where trans men were in that position because they have it so hard you know like they're the forefront they're the ones getting the most hate all of the time and it's like would i either rather be forgotten about or hated on constantly and it's 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 messed up <laughs> <laughs> which which one's better um although arguably when the only voices that get promoted are trans women it it's not helpful right because then younger trans masculine people don't have role model role models and yep. it for the general public that's watching the news or you know a tv show or a movie they also don't have the experience of normalizing the fact that this is what trans men look like yep mm-hmm and that much like trans women, we come in a range of colors and sizes and and degrees of masculine expression versus not. We come in a variety of sexualities. The fact that we're basically treated as if we don't even really exist is, I think, detrimental to us. And unfortunately, Kind of the only voices that we've had that that even some people know about are not necessarily the voices that I want representing the community. Mm-hmm. Felt that one pretty hard. <laughs> I hear you on that. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I like it. I guess it's it's easy for me to think of more trans women who are like famous. I guess you could say like I think of Dylan Mulvaney and then like. Right. Laverne Cox, Janet Mock, you know, there's a number of people. But I, it's harder for me to think about trans men. Well, you, there's basically three. Chaz Bono, Elliot Page, yep. Buck Angel. <laughs> yeah, him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then you have like Caitlyn Jenner too. Well, that's true. They they have their own problematic person, um, mm-hmm. but arguably ours is worse um, yeah. <laughs> for a variety of reasons. And you know, out of those three people, who's the only one that I'm honestly willing to have speak on our behalf? And that's Elliot. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the same thing. And it's rough. I feel like it's harder for us to gain that level of respect or support from people. Because obviously, as we just said, like trans men are forgotten about. And like the only way to not be forgotten about is to just keep making ourselves visible. But then I can't even blame trans men or trans people in general who don't want to be in that spotlight because of the state of the world right now. So it's like, yeah, it's it's a rough And In so many places, in particularly in the United States, but really all over the world. Mm hmm. The kinds of political oppression that we're facing now makes it really hard to want to be out and visible. And so, you know, I recognize that I sit with a fair amount of privilege, right? 
I'm white, I'm middle-aged, I look the way that I look, I sound the way that I sound, I have the educational background that I have, I live in a state that is solidly progressive and has been for basically the entirety of my lifetime. I, I'm not worried that somehow trans rights are going to be stripped away in the state of Washington anytime soon. And so I'll use that privilege to the best of my ability to uplift the voices of people who can't or choose not to yeah. out of their safety needs. Yeah, no, 100%. I think it's super, super, super important for, as I said, I can't judge anybody for not wanting to because of the state of the world. But sometimes like when I see when I see creators who are trans and who don't talk about their transition at all on social media, like they kind of hide it. I respect it because I can't, like on paper, I feel like I can't be right. mad at you. You know what I mean? Like that's your choice. But a part of me is like, oh, like help us. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Like, I don't know. I Like use your platform, but also you have to protect yourself as well. And I think what you're doing, and we're going to dive more into it a little bit later, but what you're doing on TikTok Dude, I've been following you forever, like for years now. And I think what you're doing on TikTok is so important because as I said 15 times already, trans men are forgotten about. And yeah. like the youth, I, I mean, I see it on all of your videos. Like, damn, I didn't know we lived this long. And that's like such a sad sentence to hear, but like it's true because yeah. we're just so I mean, it's heartbreaking forgotten. for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, on a daily basis, I feel like I'm getting punched in the gut, you know, both <laughs> by the comments that people post publicly, but certainly by the messages that I get privately from people who yeah. are afraid to come out, who have family that are kicking them out of their homes, who can't find access to medical care because of the state that they live in, who really fear for their lives and who have never seen an older trans man ever. And to some extent, I, you know, I think a lot of my peers are not, they're not interested in, in being on Instagram or TikTok, right? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. For whatever reasons. I mean, some of it yeah. honestly is, you know, people don't want to have to learn some new piece of technology. And <laughs> some of it is, depending on what you're doing work-wise, it's a lot of time to devote to trying to access an audience and keep generating um, yeah. information and content for folks. 100%. So yeah. I understand why a lot of my friends aren't on TikTok, mm -hmm. but I keep telling them, but you're missing out because young mm -hmm. people need to see our faces. Mm -hmm. They need to know that we not only get to live this long, but that we exist and that we collectively have done an awful lot to change the world for trans people. I, one of the things that frustrates me no end and I'm actually working on writing a book right now, which is kind of a a little bit of an encyclopedia of here's a bunch of trans men that you should know about and the work <laughs> that they've that. done to change the world. But I think about people that I know, like Shannon Minter or Jameson Green, um, Jen Levi, uh, uh, Drew Levisor. Um, you know, and granted, a whole bunch of us are lawyers, um, but that doesn't take away from the work that we've done. You wouldn't have same-sex marriage in this country if it weren't for Shannon Minter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, everything, like, intertwines, too. Like, I you hear know, what you're saying. And, and I'm going to pat myself on the back and say you Hell wouldn't yeah. have the ability to change your passport as easily as you do if it weren't for work that I collaborated in doing. There he because is. the state of Washington changed its birth certificate policy to make it very simple. The Secretary of State, Clinton, 
took that policy and basically used that to make a model for the for the US passport office in terms of changing your gender markers. So wow. the work that trans men have done is huge, but you never hear about us. Nope. As you said, it's the misogyny too. Yeah. You know, and I mean, Jameson's been instrumental in getting medical schools to teach medical students about trans health care and developing mm -hmm. the whole system around that through a project that he was working on uh, with Stanford Medical School. So the kinds of impact that trans men have had is really fundamental for the rights of all trans people. Hell yeah. And like, even as a trans person myself, I even feel like uneducated on things that trans men have done for other trans people. Like even, I feel yeah. like the information has been withheld from me, even when I've gone looking for it. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's messed up. And you know, what's kind of crazy to me is like a little off topic, but I was thinking about it before. Um, in the sense of trans men are forgotten about like, like, I feel like society would not even like think for a second that it's possible for you to be trans because you're older. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't even cross their mind. Like, right. yes, young trans men, like we don't, we can't believe that we live this long, but like right wing people don't even, can't even think that far to be like, oh, no your trans, you know what I mean? Like, Oh no, I, oh, you know, and I've gotten that throughout my life. I've gotten people that are like, well, no way. And it's like, yeah. well, why would I lie about it? Yeah. No, I don't. Well, that would be a weird lie. <laughs> it's a weird flex to try to take. Right. So, <laughs> um, so I'm always really surprised when that's the kind of response that I get from people. The other thing that mm -hmm. honestly it cracks me up is is people who come onto my social media and try to make the argument, oh, well, you're just a woman who is pretending to be a man. And it's like, you know, come tell me that to my face <laughs> yeah. because you <laughs> sound ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't ever say that to my face. Right. You're just doing it because you're sitting behind a keyboard. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I actively do with my social media is that I just block and delete people that post any kind of negative comments because we see too much of that elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's that's really healthy. I feel like I could learn from you. <laughs> and it's pointless to engage with people who've already made up their minds mm -hmm. or who are part of the cult of MAGA or the right wing or or religious evangelicals, mm -hmm. you're never going to be able to talk reason with them. So why even, there's no point in engaging. All it does is raise your own blood pressure. It's true. Yeah. There's no point. They're commenting in order to get engagement. Yeah. Stop giving them what they want. No, yeah. I think in the beginning when I started this podcast like a year ago, I definitely engaged <laughs> a lot yeah. with it because, I mean, I couldn't help myself. But now as the my channel grows and the hate comes in like waves now sometimes, it's getting to a point where I'm like, all right, like all they want is <laughs> is my attention. And when I give yeah. them that, they feel like they're winning. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, they don't stop either. You you reply once and they'll keep going for the whole day. Yeah. Like they, all they want is just attention on the internet because they're not yeah. getting it anywhere else. I just block and delete. Like I don't respond yeah. to it. I don't, yeah, every it. once in a while, I'll, somebody will post something and I will not have been on to check my, my comments for a while. And so some of my regular followers will try to engage with people and i'm like no don't just don't just yeah don't worry about it like mm -hmm. let that person live in the misery that they live in mm -hmm. yeah 
I will say once in a while, if the comment is real good and it just makes no sense and it proves my points, I will I maybe like post it on my story or something because it makes for good content yeah. sometimes. Well, but... I, I might screen grab it. Yeah. And then delete them and then <laughs> yeah. use that. <laughs> right. Um, use them for a little bit of clout. <laughs> right. Like, um, <laughs> But one of the things that I've found as a result, and you know, and maybe it's also because I'm my my age, um, I actually don't get a lot of hater comments on my content. That's good. I'm always kind of surprised when I do get something because I really don't get very much of it at all. That's good. I'm happy to hear that. Maybe it's because of your age. Like I f- sometimes I feel like people come for me because I look very young and like even in public spaces even when they don't know i'm trans like people treat me like i'm an idiot because maybe i am i don't know but (laughs) but yeah i feel like maybe you get a little bit more respect because you're older but if someone really hates trans people i don't think that'll stop them either though that doesn't stop but yeah um but there's still very little of that you know compared to what i see on other people's social media um Mm -hmm. So I'm thankful for that. Um, yeah. But also, you know, if you do follow me, like I'm actively deleting those people because <laughs> none of us need to be constantly bombarded with that kind of hatred. No, no, life's too short to it even is. focus on that stuff. And like, I don't, I feel myself, some, I feel myself sometimes get like too. Like if if I post a video that has like too many hate comments, it just got more hate comments than positive comments. Like I feel like I focus too hard on them sometimes. And like then I'm questioning why am I doing this? Is it is it worth it? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like this is what I love to do. I can't let these people take it away from me. You know what I mean? Right. And then I – I just I feel like I focus more on the hate comments than the positive content comments sometimes, and then I feel like I'm not grateful enough. And then I get in my head. I'm like, you know what? Delete. I don't care. Stick to the positive comments. You know. You know. You're also talking about a very common aspect of the human condition, right? Mm. You can get ten positive comments from somebody, and the minute you get a negative one, you focus on the negative. Right. And so like one of the things that I see a lot with my coaching clients is the need to develop a sense of self-confidence and self-worth that they've been missing, whether that's through family of origin messaging, school messaging, or just being out in the world messaging. But it's really easy to focus on the negative comments that you get instead of really paying attention to the positive things. Your light went out again. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I think it's flickering. I'm just going to let it be. Sorry if my lighting sucks, everybody. I don't care. I'll fix Um, it later in editing. (laughs) So, you know, one of the things that I try really hard to promote with any groups that I happen to be involved with or that I run And certainly what I do with my clients is my job is to gas you up and we need to gas each other up. Yeah. Nobody else is going to do it for us. So we have to do it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you should surround yourself with people who are going to gas you up, not in the sense that they're going to lie to you. You always need to have people in your life that are going to be able to pull you aside and tell you the truth about who you are. And where you maybe have misstepped. Mm-hmm. But really surround yourself with people who are supportive. Yeah. And I think that's that's a huge reason. Because I came out as trans when I was 16. I'm 25 now. And up until I was 23, 24, I, I didn't know a single other trans person. I went my entire transition without speaking to another trans person. When I started this podcast, I started my Discord that has a bunch of other trans people in it. Uh, my guests now have become some of my best friends. I'm surrounded by transness now and such positivity that like it when I see hate comments like that and stuff, it makes... The people that I have in my life now make 
all of that mean absolutely nothing to me. And I feel like yeah. when people say having other trans people in your life is huge, I never really believed it before, but now I preach it all the time that everybody listening is probably sick of me saying it, but it truly, truly is so important. When you came out as trans, wait, you said you, you've been on hormones for over 20, 20 29 years, now, years. Right? 29 years. Wow. So when did you come out as trans? 1995. Wow. Did you know any other trans people back then? Yeah, I did. You did? Um, okay. So I... Let's see. How do I back up? Because it's kind of a longer story. So when I was uh, in law school, uh, which was from 1985 to 1988, um, there was a group of us at law school who were queer who all hung out together and formed the first at that time gay and lesbian student organization at the law school that later turned into the um you know a, a group of lawyers in the community who were queer and a number of other things shortly after i got out of law school I was approached by the mayor's office to sit on a advisory council to the mayor on gay and lesbian issues. And then that later turned into the Seattle Commission for Lesbians and Gays, which is now the Seattle Commission for Sexual Minorities, I think. Um, so I sat on that commission for four or five years and was co-chair of the commission for two of those years. So my political activism or in queer community had been ongoing since I was in school. And in, also in about 1988, I got involved with the leather community. And the leather community in Seattle uh, was very vibrant, um, had a lot of folks, a lot of political activism. And through that community is where I first met other trans people. Um, and then also through my activist channels that were a little bit more mainstream, I met some folks. So like one of the first people that I met was Kate Borenstein. Kate used to live here in Seattle and she That's and I became so fast friends, uh, remain friends today. And then I met a number of trans men who ended up being really influential for me. So one of them was Dr. Jason Cromwell, who is a has a PhD in cultural anthropology. He wrote the book FTMs and Trans Men. Jason and I uh, have had a very deep friendship for a long time. Uh, and then I met Billy Lane, who, and Jason had transitioned. He's 12 years older than me. So he's 70 three now um and he transitioned when he was 19 wow that's a long time to be on testosterone so and then um i met uh billy lane who uh he's a couple of years younger than me um but had transitioned prior to me um in the community and then from there i just started meeting a whole bunch of other people mm-hmm and then in 1995, um, the first FTM Conference of the Americas was held in San Francisco, and that was spearheaded by Sky Renfro and Mike Hernandez and some other folks who are part of the leather community as well. And then we did the second FTM Conference of the Americas here in Seattle, and that committee included myself Jason, Billy Lane, and some other folks. And we had, I don't know, probably 400 people in attendance. So very early on, I found community, you know, and in some respects, I kind of look at it now and I think to myself, well, gosh, even in the pre-internet days, we were really good at finding each other. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, how do you find anybody without a phone? <laughs> like in a lot of 
sort of the the aspects of queerness that existed pre-internet. Once you met somebody, then you met everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you meet one person, then you meet another five people, then you meet another 20 people. Um, mm. You know, and I joke about it, but it used to be like, it felt like you literally knew every other trans guy on the planet. <laughs> That that's probably a really cool feeling though. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's probably dope. Now you I can't do math. How old were you when you came out? Thirty two. Thirty two. Well, I came out okay. as queer when I was fifteen. Came out as trans when I was thirty two. Wow. Okay. Uh, can I ask uh, like when you came out, like how did your family and everybody around you take it? My family was great. Um, I think I finally made sense to my parents. I mean, when I came out about being queer when I was 15, um, my dad was great. My mom was, I mean, she was supportive, but she was, she was afraid of what my life was going to be, that it was going to be hard. And I've been a very masculine presenting person from the day I was born until now. So um, I'm not sure why it was a surprise to her, but um, she kind of was like, well, I, I don't want anybody to know. And I was like, well, mom, all they got to do is look at me. I'm not really sure how you think that it's not abundantly visible mm -hmm. that I'm not straight. Um, all right. But when I came out as trans, I think I finally made some sense to them. And they never missed a beat. They never misgendered me. Wow. They never called me by my old name. Um, the rest of my family in Sweden were great about it. One of my cousins um, was talking to her about it. And she's like, well, you know, we've all been wondering for a while how long it was going to be. <laughs> so... Um, you know, uh, I think I had that as a great experience. Um, my wow. colleagues in the legal world were at least supportive to my face. I don't know what they were saying behind my back. Mm. The queer community, that was kind of a different story. Um, the men's community, the men's leather community was incredibly supportive. Um, they were mm -hmm. great. They'd been supported supportive of me prior to my transition and they continue to be supportive of me afterwards. The women's community was hateful. Was it like a feminism type deal? Like Yeah, it was a uh, you are uh taking the easy way out. You're mm -hmm. rejecting uh you know, you're a traitor. Which, you know, I would always argue back, well, you know, my understanding of feminism is to be the most self-actualized person you can be. So I'm just doing that. But you're punishing me for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, whenever I hear people arguing about things like, oh, well, we're losing all the butches. No, you're not. <laughs> I see them all on ridiculous TikTok. ridiculous no, argument <laughs> to make. But I also think that there's an element of, but wait a minute, I'm attracted to you, and now I don't know what I need to do about my own identity. Mm -hmm. It like almost poses as a threat to their sexuality in a way, which is right. all it takes is to look inward and ask yourself questions, but go off, I guess. <laughs> you get to identify however you want to identify Mm -hmm. You know, I choose to identify as a queer man because my politics are queer. My outlook on life is queer. My enculturation is queer. So my whole worldview is based in queerness. My sexual and romantic attractions are also kind of queer, although I'm primarily attracted to, to femme women. And by femme, I mean femme identity, F-E-M-M-E, -M -M -E, as, mm -hmm. you know, the yeah. counterpart to Butch. Um, right. So that is its own identity. It's not about being a feminine woman, but it's about being a queer identified femme. Mm -hmm. 
Like I, right. the idea of dating straight women is befuddling to me. Like, what am I going to talk to them about? <laughs> they don't share my same yeah. worldview. No. Mm -hmm. no, yeah, 100%. And you know, the, the group of women who didn't accept you when you came out, called you a traitor, said, you, you know, you were choosing the easy way out as if like, I don't know, like traitor, like as if you didn't live 32 years of your life as woman, like you understood the struggle and that struggle will always be with you and you will always remember it. Yeah. You will always like be able to, um, I can like always empathize with, with what it is, Yeah, you know, yeah. and yeah, my experience of being identified as female by the broader populace, right, mm -hmm. is also different from that of feminine appearing women. I will never understand fully what that experience is because I was never a feminine presenting person. Yeah. But I do understand the struggles for masculine appearing AFAB people. And I understand, at least tangentially, the struggle that all AFAB people have in terms of discrimination, objectification, sexualization, violence, um, you know, having their voices ignored. I've had that experience and I've seen the people that I love have that experience. And so how exactly am I being a traitor when I'm using my experiences to elevate the voices of whoever I can and to try to ensure that trans men don't um, engage in the same kind of toxic masculinity as our cisgender peers do in an effort to try to seem more male. Yeah. And it's, it's, it makes me mad when cisgendered women don't support trans people, like are very hateful towards trans people because cis women and trans people, very similar struggles, not the same, but very similar struggles where the enemy is cis men. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when, again, very different struggles, but also very similar at the same time. So, like, it's also weird how all of these separate communities want to hold their struggles so close to them and they don't want to share any of it. You know what I mean? Right. Like, just how that group of women, like, didn't let you have your own struggle and you were no longer a part of their struggle because you were transitioning into a man. Like, we're all human. <laughs> we all have the same struggles from time to time. Like, I don't, yeah. it's very like gatekeeping of, it is. Like, you know, and it's, it's just weird to me, you know, and it's funny how that sense of gatekeeping continues to be perpetuated. Like I see some younger trans masculine people trying to tell us older guys that we can't use the term FTM anymore. It's like, who are mm. you to tell me what terms I can use to describe myself? Mm. Actually, that brings up a question for me. How do you feel about the word transsexual? Mm -hmm. Fine with it. I mean, I that's the term that was used when I came out. Like, do I think yeah. that it's particularly descriptive? No. Do I think that it is and has historically been used as a tool to separate people within trans identity absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. you know particularly i think amongst trans women it was very much used as a a designator of whether you were pre-op or post-op in terms of genital surgery mm. um, right less so for trans men i think for us it's always been have you had chest surgery or not like we recognize the limitations of the surgical options that options that we have for genital surgery. So I think for trans masculine people, we've always sort of considered the surgery as being chest surgery, but we never really did the same kind of authenticity test that I think trans women 
used to do with each other and perhaps still do. Yeah. Um, based on whether you have or haven't had any particular kind of surgery. You know, one of the things that I try to to say to folks all the time is, listen, language evolves. Yeah. You know, and so for my peers that are my age and older, you know what? Language evolved for all of us, too, around anything related to queer. You know, when I grew up, queer was a slur. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you didn't use it. Dyke was a slur. We took dyke back and used that as a very proud identifier. You know, back when I started in politics, it was gay and lesbian. Then it became LGBT. Then it became mm-hmm. LGBTQ. Then it became LGBTQ plus or however many other letters of the alphabet you want to add on to the end of that. Mm-hmm. So language evolves. And we have to evolve with it. Yeah. You know, when I first came out as queer, there were older lesbians who refused to use the word lesbian. They were gay women. Much as language has evolved throughout my lifetime, and it will continue to evolve, it doesn't mean that anything is necessarily right or wrong. It's just that it's evolving. I agree. Yeah, I asked you that because I've notice a lot of younger people say that the word transsexual is out the word transgender is in but i see people like buck angel and who are a little bit older say that they want to keep the word transsexual because transgender doesn't yeah, let's not talk about buck trans- because he's basically become yeah, yeah. a turf <laughs> no yeah 100 percent. but you know, I, he's just uh, the first one to it, pop the you know and i have my opinions about him that i've held for ever since he came out, which was after me, although he likes to fashion himself as being like the oldest trans person alive, which is not even close to being true. Um, (laughs) I have found him and his branding to be problematic from the start, and I find his personal behavior to be abhorrent. So um, I just think he's a trash person, and I'm not afraid to say it. I've told him that directly. Period. No, I love that. I think we, it is important for somebody who is close to his age to be the like opposing side of him because. Well, you know, I mean, let's get real. Buck came up with a phrase as a marketing tool for his porn. Yeah, I know. No, now, that that I, always I appreciate me off. entrepreneurial spirit. I am a hundred percent pro sex work of whatever type of sex work that happens to be. Sex work is work. I don't appreciate the fact that because he chose the specific phrase that he chose, it has informed not only the media, but people within queer community across the board to think about trans men and sexuality in only one way. What's up, y'all? If you're enjoying this conversation, then you should definitely go check out the HRT Patreon. Um, It is very cheap. It's only a couple bucks a month. Um, And with that, you get bonus content from a bunch of other episodes. Uh, And if you want to see this podcast grow and you want to help me out, I would greatly appreciate it. You can find the link in the description below, as always. And yeah, you want to hear the rest of this conversation? Gotta go find it on Patreon. All right. I love you all so much. Let's continue with this episode. I wanted to ask you, because we're kind of hitting the 50-minute mark now, I wanted to ask you uh, more questions about yourself and your journey, um, if you don't mind. I forgot to ask you before about, in, are you on uh, injections or gel for your hormones? Um, so I have tried everything. Um, well, I shouldn't say everything because I haven't done pellets yet. Um, so I started out on IM injections, um, and honestly did those for pretty consistently for 25 of the last 29 years. I tried patches Mm -hmm. at one point. Um, that was a failed experiment. Um, 
being hairy and trying to stick things to yourself is <laughs> really unpleasant. And I, I had an that, allergic yeah. reaction to the adhesive. Mm. Um, I tried two different forms of gel, hated both of them. Um, really? Yeah, I couldn't stand it. It was like, you know, one, it's the whole, you're sticky. Um, mm. And to take the dosage that I was on was like two packets of the gel. And then you're rubbing it. And then, you know, the other problem, particularly when you are someone who's dating women, is the concern about transfer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a no. Um, <laughs> and then I switched to sub Q probably three years ago, and I've been really happy with that. Okay, that's cool. I asked because I talk about it all the time. I was on IM shots for seven years. I just switched to gel. I, cause I just, I hate, I got tired of sticking myself every week. That was my problem. I just, it yeah. seemed to me that like the anxiety of it was just getting worse and worse as time went on. Uh, so I switched to gel and I'm surprised he didn't like gel. I feel like, I don't know. It's yeah. much easier for me than the injections now. And I do yeah. have a girlfriend, but I just stay away from her for like an hour <laughs> when I put it on every morning. But I'm very curious about trying to do pellets. Um, everybody that I know that's done that is really happy with the result because you basically get a really level, um, dose. A lot of the guys that I know that are in other countries, like in Australia, um, they get an injection once every two months, uh, because of the formulation yeah, that, that they're on. So there's a lot of products that are out in the world that we don't have in the U S. And so one of the things that I always try to tell folks is there's a lot of different ways that you can access tea, and it's just a matter of figuring out what is going to be the best for you and your body. Yeah, 100%. Everybody's different, I've learned. Everybody's different. Now, that being said, I do think that you get the best initial results by doing IM injections. I agree, yeah. And I think yeah. you get the best results if you're on a consistently full dose from the start and injecting once a week. Yeah. The only reason I was comfortable was because I was been on, I had been on IM for so long, but there's like a stigma around gel. I felt like, obviously, I was misinformed by media. I feel like that once I started gel, I would start to detransition for some reason. And obviously that's not the case, but like, <laughs> I, I was afraid to go on gel because I felt like I was just going to lose like my masculine features. Cause it's like not as strong or whatever as I am, which is like true, but you're not going to detransition from it or anything. Well, I, you know, um, and again, I think as long as you can start on, I am and start at essentially a full dose. Um, you're going to get changes and they're going to, they're going to come as rapidly as possible. What irritates me is doctors who put people on deliberately low doses for long periods of time. I have a friend who his initial doctor had kept him on like 0.25 milliliters every week for like five years and he was wondering why he wasn't having more physical changes. And I'm like, well, why in the hell are you on that dose? Yeah. That's really weird. I mean, I've heard of people who choose to be on a lower dose, but choosing like to be is one to thing, be. but when you, your yeah. doctors is making that decision for you. Yeah, no, that's to me. That's up. just that's another an form of malpractice. Doctor. So, Oh yeah. 100%. 100%. No, that's that's messed up. That pissed me off. Yeah, it's like, no, you don't get to substitute your bias against yeah. trans people in terms of your treatment of me. And then acting like you're supportive of it by just right. giving a little bit is, that's messed up. Um, one last little thing I wanted to talk to you about before we go is, well, are you are you a parent, Spencer? I am. Nice. Now, parents. can I ask you when, 
when did you did you come out before or after you had a kid? Oh, well, it was be- long before. I met my wife, my ex-wife, uh, in 1998. Uh, so that was after I transitioned. Um, we got married in um, 2001. Um, and we had our daughter in 2004. So. Wow. That's, I know, like, again, like, trans people can do everything that a cis person can do 100%. But I, it's so nice to hear that especially that you had a kid after you came out as trans like i i want to have kids so badly one day and i feel like i have been told i have been led to believe that it might not be possible for me until i kind of woke up one day and was like hey actually that's completely possible for me i'm being told the wrong information complete fallacy so my friend jason uh he and his wife they got together after he transitioned and again he transitioned when he was 19 years old um and they had a child yeah that's so cool. now... can i ask about yeah. can i ask about the process for you yeah we used a sperm donor anonymous sperm donor and went through iui that's really cool i yeah. i mean i feel like i just i just talked about it in my last after dark episode with my girlfriend people even trans people even me at one point are there's so many options for like fertility wise for trans people that people don't even think about too. And I, I just, I think that's really cool. You know, I mean, I've had friends that have adopted, um, Mm -hmm. post transition. Uh, I've had other people use IUI and then certainly I've had friends who have been gestational carriers. You know, they go off of T for a while, they get pregnant, they have a baby and they go back on T. Yeah. I was always afraid that because of when I started testosterone, I didn't freeze my eggs. I was always afraid that like the testosterone was like killing my ovaries or some shit and that I wouldn't be able to. Yeah, I've been told many times that that's not that's probably oh. not going to happen. You know, here's the thing that I'll tell you, and, and this is something that I've been saying now for nearly three decades. Doctors don't know much of anything when it comes to trans men. And they don't bother to find out. So we only have one another to really rely upon, right? And so what I can tell you is that trans men are fathers, whether through IUI, IVF, adoption, or carrying a baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I wish I knew that a while ago because I like broke my own heart thinking that I wasn't going to be able to have kids because I'm so misinformed (laughs) so dumb (laughs) like it's it's just crazy how much you don't how much society in general doesn't know about trans people even trans people themselves like it's just right you know uh, and like like anybody dealing with fertility issues there are options you know, so if if you and your girlfriend one day want to have kids together, you have options. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and that makes me so happy to hear. And it makes me very, very happy to see another trans man who has gone through it and became an awesome parent, too. Like, that's just, that's everything for younger trans people. And before we go, I do want to shed light on your TikTok page a little bit because your TikTok page is where I like really realized that trans men could be parents. We could live until we're whatever age and that it is possible. And again, I know that's like a very like, like, duh, you should know that, but like, we don't, you know what I mean? And it's, we don't. And I just want to thank you from like younger trans men, just like, thank you for sharing your knowledge and putting yourself out there for us. I think it's super important. And your content, I love the Daddy Spencer shtick you have. I think that's so clever. I think it's because a lot of younger trans men don't have fathers. And we can't, or even if we do, like, we can't, I can't, like, ask my dad some of these questions. You know what I mean? Like, so it is, it's really important for us to have. So just thank you, honestly. I think what you're doing is awesome. Thank you. Um, 
before we go, is there anything you want to plug? Any social media handles? You mentioned a book coming, maybe. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram or TikTok under Daddy Spencer, and um, or you can just hit uh, the hashtag Trans Dad. You'll find me that way too. Um, I have my own podcast that you can find on Spotify and YouTube, which is called This Effin Show, which is me and another friend of mine who is fifty uh, and transitioned. Uh, about 20 years ago it's just us talking about whatever we talk about um mostly from the perspective of being middle-aged trans guys uh and um that's about it for now i'll have a i'm working on putting together a patreon so i can hopefully finish this book that i'm writing um awesome so that you can all know about some really awesome trans men that have done some pretty phenomenal things in the world Period. I think that's super important. Uh, yeah, make sure you go follow Spencer on all of his platforms. Uh, you won't regret it. The content he puts out is absolutely chef kiss to all younger trans people. Um, and make sure you follow me at HRT Podcast on TikTok and Instagram. I post all the time. And make sure you join my Discord. I got a lot of trans people on there just hanging out, having a good time. Subscribe to my Patreon. There will be bonus content on there from this episode and other past episodes. Uh, follow me on Twitch. I stream every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that's about it for this episode. Spencer, thank you so much for being on. This was an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, y'all. I will see you next week. Bye.